Okay, thank you all uh, for coming. Um, the title of my talk is Conceptual Replication and Establishing Robust Theories versus Robust Findings. And I'm gonna start off with a test question that I give on my, in my intro social psych course. Uh, I do one lecture all about method, research methods, and this is a test question that I got from the test bank of the first Smith and Mackey version of their social psych text. So I'll let you read the question and think about the answer. This is one of my favorite questions, by the way. It's very good predictive, it's a good item. You know, I do item analyses. So at least in my class, the answer to this question is different, different, different. That's the answer in my class. And the reason is because that's how we build a theory. The question is about building a theory. And if you wanna know something about an idea or a theory, you have to test it in bunches of different ways. Now, when I started telling people that I was gonna talk about this at this conference, um, I got almost exact split in reactions. About half the people I told said, why in the world would you talk about that? Everybody knows that. It's the stupidest thing to ever talk about. And the other half of the people said, yes, that's so great, you have to talk about that. You absolutely have to talk about it. And I think what led me to finally decide that I did wanna talk about it are all the interactions I've had with students and younger faculty members who do seem to be legitimately confused about what we're supposed to be doing and is conceptual replication something we're supposed to care about and do anymore? And I've had a number of those conversations and that's why I'm talking about this here. So here's, I'm, I'm gonna give you a little background and try and convince you that this is something that's worth talking about. And here's part of the reason, we have seen uh, some pretty aggressive stances about conceptual replication and what it isn't good for. Here's a quote from a blog, from a pretty uh, prominent blogger. Psychology can ill afford the kind of muddled thinking that gives rise to the notion of conceptual replication. The field has taken big hits lately, but prominent fraud cases such as Diedrich Stoppel producing very bad publicity. The irony of the Stoppel case is that if we truly valued actual replication rather than crusty brand replication, this fraud could have been exposed years sooner and before he had made such a damaging impact. Now, I'll just note, first of all, it is easy, just as easy to make up data from direct replications as conceptual replications. And I think this is, this is a good, I think this quote indicates really well one of the problems is that repeatability and fraud have occasionally been conflated, which isn't really helpful to anybody. Here is another set of quotes from a very prominent psychologist who wrote a paper. I'll just let you read this yourselves. Can you, you can read that. Note the, the continued use of the word insidious. This isn't just something that maybe you know, doesn't have that much value. This is something that's actively damaging our field. It's a problem for our field. And we have to be wary of it, okay? It's, a, it's something to be avoided. So what I'm not gonna be doing today is criticizing direct replication. Direct replication is great. It's a, an important uh, movement for the field that we're starting to see more and more of that, that it's being published. I'm not going to tell you not to do that. Um, but I am going to suggest that everyone has to decide for themselves how to spend their time and resources. And I'm more trying to defend the conceptual replication than attack direct replication. If I wanna do conceptual replication, let me do conceptual replication, please. And supporters of conceptual replication have taken a lot of jabs in the last couple of years. I, you, know, you saw those other quotes. Um, there have been a lot of insinuations that people who care about conceptual replication are being bad scientists who don't really care about truth, that truth should probably be capitalized. In another blog post, the distinction was made between true replicators who do direct replication and reactionaries of the people who do conceptual replication, which strikes me as very odd people trying to advance theory or reactionary. So if you care about conceptual replication, I guess my message is don't see the term replicator. You are a replicator. And don't see the scientific moral high ground. This is not a question of good or bad science or uh, morality. And really what the question comes down to is what is the unit of analysis? What do you care most about? If we're doing direct replication, the unit of analysis is the effect. Is this effect reproducible? It's not going to tell us what the effect means. It might not tell us anything more than we understand now with this operationalization of this variable, the effect that has on this operationalization of that variable, and it may not tell us anything more than that. It could replicate but not mean what we think it means. It could replicate, but we could be replicating a flawed design. 
And ironically, I do think that this focus on replicating effects has the unintended consequence of maintaining an emphasis on flashy effects, which I think is something that probably everybody was a little bit uncomfortable with uh, in the last decade or so. Um, but I'm not, you know, I, I'm not trying to levy that as, as criticism. I just think that's maybe an unintended consequence. Conceptual replication, the unit of analysis is the idea or theory. Is this idea a valid idea? Is this theory a valid theory? When we test theories, we need different operationalizations of our variables to produce converging, converging evidence that we've learned something more than something about specific operationalizations. We've learned about constructs and how they relate to one another. And unfortunately, our constructs are really messy, right? What does intelligence mean? What does prejudice mean? What is a cognitive load? What does it mean to be in a positive mood, right? The fact that our constructs are so messy means that the need for triangulation and conceptual re replication is very strong in our field uh, versus, say, physics or chemistry. And I know I'm oversimplifying that they also have complicated constructs and difficulties, not like we do, generally. So, but here's what it's not about, the distinction between direct and conceptual replication that I've seen a lot of discussion about. It's not about good or bad science. Everybody is seeking the truth. The question is, which truth are you seeking? Are you seeking the truth about an effect, or are you seeking the truth about a theory? This is a value judgment and a choice. This is not about some, you can do good direct or bad direct replications. You can do good conceptual or bad conceptual replications. So this isn't about good or bad science. It's not about type one versus type two error. This is another claim that I've seen made in many places, or false positives and false negatives. The question is false positives and false negatives about what? We can have false positives and negatives about effects. We can have false positives and negatives about theories. And so I also think that it's an orthogonal question about whether you care more about type one or type two error. Promotion versus prevention. There's been a lot of talk that conceptual replication is about promotion and direct is about prevention, and I don't think that's quite accurate either. The question is what are you trying to promote or prevent? Are you trying to promote replication of effects that we think we need to do and need to know about? Or are you trying to promote ideas and, and testing of ideas? And finally, need for certainty. There's this idea that you know, somehow people doing direct replication have a higher need for certainty. And I also don't think that's necessarily the case. It's certainty about what? You could be have a very high need for certainty about your theory or a very high need for certainty about a particular effect that you have. We can demand lots and lots of certainty about our theories. We can debate how much certainty should be required at either the level of the effect or the idea. And so I also think that's an orthogonal issue. So how do we make progress? We can and do honestly disagree about the best route to progress. Should we confirm every effect multiple times before we do anything else? Should we do, is there a certain number of direct replications that should be required before moving on? At the other end of the extreme, you can argue we should only focus on generating and testing new ideas. You know, every, everything you do should be a new idea, and don't, don't even bother you know, trying to triangulate on your old idea. Right? And the, the argument has been made that direct replication de-emphasizes discovery of new and interesting ideas and stifles creativity. I also want to argue against this. I do not think this is necessarily the case. Surely it shows the rate at which claims are made about new and interesting ideas. There are going to be fewer new and interesting ideas floated out there and fewer claims made about them. But we don't really have any good actuarial data. We don't know the reality of the blend of, of repeatability and conceptual triangulation that would produce the most actual gain in knowledge. And you know, there are probably techniques that someone who is sufficiently motivated could apply to try and give us some kind of actuarial analysis. How much should we be focusing on directly replicating versus generalizing and conceptually replicating? So I think the, the final, well not the final, the second to final thing I guess that I want to talk about is how to make failed conceptual replication useful. Because this has been sort of one of the primary issues and criticisms of conceptual replication. And this is another quote from a pretty prominent paper about these kinds of issues. And I'll give you a moment to read it.
So the idea here is that conceptual replication is great for confirming a theory, but useless for disconfirming a theory. And the net result, here's another, here's one more quick quote. So the problem is deciding what, what does it mean when we run a conceptual replication and it fails, right? Do we say, okay, the idea is wrong? Do we manipulate things wrong or the operationalization is bad? What happened? And this is a hard kind of question to answer. But I, I think it's worth noting that interpreting and failed direct replications is fraught with the same ambiguities, and we've seen lots and lots of that in the last couple of years. There's always reasons to dismiss, dismiss failed results or failed replications. They're always motivated people, especially, have no problem finding reasons to do this. We've seen this in a number of high-profile cases where even seemingly to the point direct replications, differences have been identified that might have been important in causing the failure of a direct replication. Really minor differences, and yeah, we can argue about how minor should be meaningful, and, but there's gonna be an argument about it, right? And so I, I don't think this issue is uh, unique to conceptual replications. We th face this issue all the time. And I think it's also worth pointing out here that the distinction between direct and conceptual replication is a continuum, especially in our field with messy uh, variables, right? It's, it's, it's not a, an either or. You know, we have relative levels of directness and relative levels of conceptualness. So I think the suggestion to abandon conceptual replication or avoid it because researchers are attempted to abuse failed conceptual replications is really not a helpful suggestion. Well, people might use this incorrectly, so we just shouldn't do it at all. We're seeing more and more of these kinds of arguments, I feel like, and I don't think that's a good kind of argument. Really, I would argue that what we need to do, just as we've seen a push for publishing failed direct replications, we need to publish failed conceptual replications to take most advantage of the data that we collect. We have to be able to identify conceptual type one error. When did we get an idea wrong? And if we don't publish the failed replications somehow, we're gonna have a hard time doing that. So we have, and it also, aside from weeding out the type one errors, we're gonna find the moderators that we care so much about. And what this involves in part is very careful pilot testing of our independent and dependent variables to make sure that they really are measuring what we say they are. Really robust manipulation checks to confirm that yeah, we actually did manipulate what we tried to manipulate. And if we do those kinds of things and we get failed conceptual replications, there ought to be a place to publish those things and talk about them. Otherwise, we're not gonna be able to learn from that hard work. So a lot of people have been working hard to combat our field's distaste for direct replications and promote their publication. And this is despite many of the same criticisms that were originally developed at direct replication and now are also developed at conceptual replication. And we've gotta work just as hard to find a way to make, take the most advantage of the information that can be gained from failed conceptual replication. So, Direct and conceptual replication can happily coexist, I would say. Let everyone choose for themselves how to spend their time and resources. I really don't like these kind of top-down, we're telling you this is how we're gonna proceed and you do need to do it this way. As reviewers and editors and authors and researchers, advocate for what you think is important, do it. You know, advocate, that's fine. But let's all try and respect one another and each other's motives. All right, everybody cares about the truth and everybody's trying to do good science here. Failed replications are a natural and expected part of science. Failed replications should not invite aspersions about motives or about goals or about fraud, for sure. And I think it's important that we all remember our job is hard. We do something that's really difficult. We try and understand people in ways that um, are not easy. And the people I know who do this work, all of you out there, care a lot about psychology and truth and good science. And the people you know do too.